Sorry. Are you sure I'm not? Okay, I'm, I'm not muted, right? Okay. Sure everyone can hear you. All right, can everybody hear me now? <laughs> All right. This one had a little bit more prep than we're used to, so we were we're still getting ready here. Well, um, happy no ruse or no ruse pirus in Farsi, and I know we have um, friends and family joining from all over the world today, so it's great to have everybody with us. I want to welcome you to my home. Um, this is the day after uh, no ruse. Yesterday was actually no ruse here in the U.S. So a lot of people celebrated yesterday, but because of World Kitchen and um, some other family things, we're gonna do ours tonight. So it works out well. Um, my son, Alex is here helping me as usual. A lot of you have uh, met Alex before. Unfortunately, our, our uh, actual full Persian is working in Oman. But I think he's tuning in today. So he's, he's watching. Um, so that's my husband, Mohammed. And as most of you know, I'm not actually Persian, um, but I play one on TV, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I've just been married to my husband for about 37 years and uh, have been cooking Persian food all those years. So that's uh, this is kind of a, a passion of mine, the, the Persian food and celebrating Nowruz and the, all the things that go with it. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Nowruz before we get started with the cooking. Um, it is celebrated by Persians and um, other, a few other countries uh, other than Iran. Um, and there's a huge contingency of Persians in what is uh, lovingly called Terangelis, which is um, the, an area of Los Angeles. Um, that is where a huge number of Iranians settled when the Shah fell back in the late 70s. They all moved to Los Angeles and now have large families and a large community out there, including some of our family. Um, so I know we did a little bit, we, we did talk about Persian tea in the very first World Kitchen, which was baklava, and I know some of you were with us then, uh, but if I can get Alex to come with me, we're going to swing around and I'm going to explain just for a minute about Persian tea and our, <laughs> you're going to go over there? Yeah. Okay, and our samovar here. So there we go. Can we see everything? Okay. So this is our stovetop samovar. A little bit later on, I'm gonna show you a more decorative version that we don't actually use because it's set up for the electric current in, in Iran. So I can't use it here. And I probably wouldn't anyway, because it's brass and it's very heavy and hard to use. But this is what we use when we have um, just friends over or a big party. So this is my samovar. And the way this works is that you put water in this big, larger bottom part and you heat that, boil that. And then in the top here, we have a, a tea strainer. Whoops, I can't lift it because it's, it's very heavy right now, but there's a tea strainer down in here and I put loose leaf tea down in there. Uh, maybe we can, you can sort of see it a little bit. I don't want to spill it there. So you put the loose leaf tea in there. You put the boiling water in from here into the small pot and you put it back up on top to steep. There is a, uh, a, a hole here in the top of this, so you can see it will steam. So you put it up here to steep, and then when you're ready to have tea for, you know, 20 people at one time, you use your small cup, or um, also called an estacon in Farsi, and you put just a little bit of this really strong tea in the bottom of your cup, and you can adjust it depending on the strength of tea you like. And then you come down here and you open the spigot and you put the hot water in. And that gives you the cup of tea that you're looking for. So this is an ingenious way to be able to serve a lot of people tea for hours. So you can keep putting, um, you know, dumping your tea leaves and putting fresh tea leaves in and making more of the tea concentrate, putting more water in the bottom and you'll have tea going all evening or all day, whatever you need it for. Now, the other thing I wanted to uh, bring up to show you because I think it's really fun is the different ways that Persians sweeten their tea. So uh, you can use what is called gand, gand, I can't ever say it right. It's like G-H-A-N-D. So this is like cubed sugar that we have, but different and better. It's more tightly packed and it's actually um, not a cube. As you can see, it's, it's just kind of oddly shaped. That's because you get these in large cones and you break them up with like a heavy 
end of a knife or something and you break them up into all these different little shapes into bite-sized pieces. Now, um, Persians, a lot of them will put this in their mouth and sort of keep it between their teeth and drink the tea through the sugar. And, and they keep doing that. Um, I don't do that. Um, another option is these beautiful little rock candy sticks that you can get. And as you can see, these have saffron in them as well. So this is my favorite way. And you can put it in here and stir it around and you're gonna get some sugar in there. If you know how much you like, just a little or a little more, I mean, I wouldn't use a whole stick on a small cup of tea, but then what my husband and I have been known to do is um, share it, you know, I'll pass it off to him and he'll use a little, or you can use the whole thing if you like, you can sit it aside and use it for your next cup because in a typical Persian household, you're gonna be drinking tea until you're floating. That's just the way it is. They're gonna keep offering you tea. Now, the, the last one I wanted to show you is a really fun little thing called pulaki. Now, pulaki is a wafer. It's a sugar wafer. And you can do the same thing. You can put it in your mouth, drink your tea through it. You can put it in your tea if you like. But this is just another fun way. And um, these also will have saffron in them or they can be plain. So that is all about tea. And I will also tell you that most Persians will drink this straight out of the boiling water. I can't do that. I tend to let mine sit and cool a little bit to the extent that most of the hostesses come around and say, oh, your tea has gotten cold. Let me give you some hot tea. And I have to explain that I'm waiting for it to cool because I just can't drink it the way they do. So there's my tea and I'll have that as we're cooking. All right, let's let Alex bring us back around. Tamara, have you had a, qu a question in chat about the sugar? Okay. Um, the question was, can you buy any of those sweeteners in State College? Um, you can check the international market. I'm not 100% sure what they have in stock at any given time. You can check there, but you can also um, absolutely get them online. I do a lot of ordering from um, an online source called Persian Basket, and they're very quick to ship. They're very... Um, efficient and and their shipping isn't bad at all. So when my husband is traveling back and forth frequently, I don't usually have to do that. He'll bring things that I need. But um, like now he's been gone for eight months due to the pandemic. So I have um, ordered a few things online that I've needed because I just couldn't get them um, through him, who, my source. Um, okay. So wanted to make sure I've talked to you a little bit about the tea. And now I'm going to go on and talk about the most important part of any Persian meal is the rice. Um, it's, it's kind of their, their national thing that it, it's, and, and I would say that for every Persian woman I've met, she does her rice just a little different. So there are lots of ways that you can do it and it will all turn out the same or close to the same, but this is just kind of the way I've learned to do it over the years. Um, you will always, always use basmati rice. You never want to use a short grain rice or um, a sticky rice, a, a more glutinous rice. You want to use basmati, which is what I have. Um, Alex, would you run and get our bag of rice? Because we, we keep ours in a canister because we use it so frequently and it's just easier that way. But um, we'll show you what we get. And this is what's available here at Wegmans, this brand. There are uh, tons of other brands, so you can get whatever you like. Obviously, we buy the um, 10 pound bag at a time. and We go through a lot of that. But as I said, I keep mine in a canister just for, for ease. So what I wanna do here, and today we're just gonna follow this recipe that you have. For my family, we would normally do um, a lot more. We would do more like six cups, but for me, for us today, we're just gonna do two. And this would be enough for two to three people. And maybe have some leftovers. All right, now, um, let's see, Alex, we're gonna show the washing process if we can do that. So we're gonna come over to the sink. I've just got my rice in. You've got this on the overhead, buddy. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I need to. Here, let me hold that. Switch over here. There we go. So um, I've got my rice just in a bowl. And 
things around so he can kind of rest that box on the, there we go. Um, now I am going to just use some sort of lukewarm water, cold-ish, but you don't want to freeze your hands because your hands are going to be in this. So you're going to run water over your rice and then you are going to use your hand and just gently fold it in on itself over and over again. And you will see that your water starts to get very cloudy. That's because the starch is coming off the rice. And that's what you wanna do. You wanna rinse a lot of this starch off the rice. So do that. Then you're gonna very carefully use your hand and hold it here so you don't lose your rice and just pour the water off. And <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something I probably shouldn't. Um, this rice that I get from Wegmans tends to be perfectly fine and it's really good rice. Occasionally you will find some rice that has weevils in it um, because that just happens. Just like with anything, with oatmeal, with anything, you'll occasionally get weevils. They're not gonna hurt you. They're not gonna hurt the rice. So this process also allows you to see if you have anything in here you shouldn't. And if you do, they're gonna float to the top and you can get rid of them. And then you're safe to use your rice if you're comfortable with that. Okay, so I'm gonna do this again. Rinse, rinse, rinse. And you will notice this time it's still pretty cloudy. I'm gonna dump the water again. And now I'm gonna put some more water on and I'm just gonna let it sit for a little bit while I'm preparing some other things. So we've rinsed it twice. We've got water in there again over the top and we're gonna let that sit for a bit. Okay, wanna come back over Alex? Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> we go up. Yeah. there we go. All right, um, so now we are going to the overhead buddy. Okay. Let's do that. Now, this is the part that I mentioned in the email. It helps if you've done this in advance because this takes some time. You're gonna take all those delicious herbs that we uh, told you to get in the recipe and you're going to clean them. You're going to pull the leaves off the stem and you're going to chop them. And a um, couple of stories that are really fun about this process in Iran. Um, my first trip to Iran, one of the things I noticed was that the ladies of the house get up and make breakfast and breakfast is usually fairly simple. It's usually um, fresh bread, um, cheese, like feta cheese, some jams, um, butter, and um, you eat the butter and bread and jam all together and that's breakfast. As soon as they clean up from breakfast, usually they start prepping for lunch. And what that one of the reasons they have to do that is because it's so full of fresh herbs and it takes time. So a lot of times I would notice that my sister-in-laws would all be over at the same time and they would just kind of sit in a circle and clean the herbs um, for, for hours while they were chatting and, and you know talking about life and the family. So the other thing about this is that um, it takes quite a while to actually chop it and get it fine enough. When I started with this batch, it was um, probably looked like twice the volume that you see now because it was, it was full leaves. So I chopped this for probably at least five or seven minutes and I could probably still stand to chop it for a few more minutes just to make sure that you're getting a really fine chop on these herbs. So just keep chopping, turn them over, get them in the middle again and keep going to get a really fine chop on your herbs and green onions. We also happen to have some chives, we threw those in. And again, this, um, whatever you wanna put in it, that's up to you. I think the cilantro and the parsley and the onion um, and the dill all are important. You could also throw in some spinach if you wanted to get some more in there of greens. Okay. 
Now this is um, a little bit more than I need for my rice because we're gonna use some of this for the cuckoo as well in a little bit. So once you get the herbs all chopped up like this, you can kind of sit them aside. And now we are going to go back to our, what did I do here? I think I moved the wrong paper. We're gonna go back to our, um, Oh, okay, our garlic, sorry, didn't do that one. So I have a garlic press somewhere. Yeah, my quick question while you're looking for that, is there actually a dill in Iran? That was one of the questions. Dill in Iran. Yes, uh-huh, they do. They also use another uh, uh, herb that we don't typically find here unless you have a Middle Eastern uh, fresh market, which is fenugreek. And I can't find that here anywhere. So I also get that dried. And as I'll show you when we make the cuckoo, uh, I typically have my husband bring dried herbs for that as well. That's pretty common. Um, another thing that you'll see if you're in an Iranian, uh, if you are ever in Iran, um, I, I found last time I was there, they have come up with this machine. So you go to the, the fresh market and you choose all the herbs you want for your different um, dishes and you give them to the, the grocer and they have this massive machine that he puts them all into and it just spins and spins and it chops them for you. So you don't have to go through all of this. So it's fabulous. And you'll just see ladies walking away with these huge plastic bags full of pre-chopped herbs. So that's just life-changing, I think, for, for a lot of those women. Um, someone said, I realized I don't have a large nonstick pot for the rice. Can I use regular stainless steel pot? You can, you likely will have it, it will likely stick on the bottom. Um, one, I'll, I'll talk you through what you can do with that to stop that from happening um, when we're doing the rice, but it really probably is best with a nonstick pan, if you, especially if you wanna do this very often and you want it to be pretty. Um, having it stick isn't the end of the world, but it's not gonna look as nice. And someone asked onions not printed in the recipe? Uh, is the green onion not there? Oh, I think we just threw some green onion in. Yeah, you don't have to. I don't think it's in the um, the uh, dried herbs I use. I think we just tend to use it. And as I said, you can put in here whatever you like. If you like certain other herbs that you want to throw in, once you kind of got a taste for it, you can put in whatever you've got, whatever you want to use. It's just a matter of having these herbs or the color and the flavor and the aroma. So I'm throwing a little bit of garlic in there as well. There we go. Someone else mentioned that they have found Fiddy Greek in airports as they traveled. Oh, but interesting. When they can do it, when they, we can travel again, they might have it also in markets in larger cities. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I have never seen it in a market here, so that's good to know. Okay, so we now have our garlic in there. I'm just gonna mix that up a little bit. Someone else says you can order fenugreek from Penzies. 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 Oh, dried fenugreek. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Penzies. I have a lot of their spices. They're a great company. All right, we will leave that there for now and we will come back to um, our rice and we will get it in the pot. So I can bring it over here, Alex, that's fine. Right. I don't want to have you moving everything around so much. I know it's a pain. Okay, so I have a pot here. Am I on the overhead or I'm on, on your front? Okay, that's fine. We have the pot here. Um, and so what I'm going to do, and we don't, we're not going to move the camera again. I'm just going to rinse that water off. One more time. And put that back into my pot. Now I'm gonna get some clean water. And put that right in. 
see what the amount's about. It, uh, yeah, and that's what I was gonna say. So as long as this, uh, got a little bit of green in there, as long as your water is um, a good fingers, first, first knuckle of your finger deep. So I, how do we show yeah, that? Feel the spot um, so when, when you put your finger in and it touches the rice, the water should come at least to your first knuckle. Does that make sense? Just so that you have enough water in there, you're sure you have enough water that it's going to um, allow you to cook well. All right, now I also will add somewhere, oh, here it is. <laughs> we'll add a little bit of salt. And again, this is just to your taste. If you are watching your salt a little less it's up to you. I would say maybe a half a teaspoon for this two cups. Okay, you rinse that off. All right, now I'm gonna come over to my stove. I'm gonna move my samovar back so we have a little bit more room here. Maybe turn the light on, there we go. All right, so I'm putting this on my burner and I actually tend to use my largest burner for this so that the um, heat is even underneath. Another thing you can do is you can get one of these diffusers that you would use like for, um, like if you were gonna use a ceramic dish on the stove or a lot of other things where you don't want something to sit direct, directly on the burner because I have a gas stove. So you can get these diffusers and that will also help to diffuse uh, the heat evenly under your pan. But for this first round with the rice, I'm gonna just keep it directly on the stove. So I'm turning this up fairly high. I'd say medium high to high to get it to boil. I'm gonna give it a good stir since we put that uh, salt in there to make sure that the salt doesn't settle on the bottom or in one particular part of the rice. And I think because we're going to start our cuckoo in a minute, I will actually put this on the second burner. Oh, there we go. All right, so now we want to um, just let this come to a boil and we're going to look for our lid, which I left over here. And we're gonna let this come to a boil. And then we're gonna, I'll show you how you will know when it's about ready to put into a colander and pour the water off for the second half of how we do this rice. So we're just gonna wait for this to boil and we will start with our cuckoo over here. Should okay. Not boiling over now. Oh yeah, <laughs> Alex makes a point. We should talk about the fact that um, you have to keep an eye on your rice and maybe don't even put the lid on tight, just kind of put it on a little bit because it, it will start to boil over if it gets a really good boil going. So you want to keep a good eye on it. Okay. And now we're back over here. And all right. Now I will talk a little bit more about these herbs. Okay. So as I said, um, Especially years and years ago, um, when we, I first started cooking like this, you really couldn't get these dried herbs here in the US. And I was in a small town in Kentucky. And then I was here in State College when my husband was in graduate school. So we just used whatever fresh herbs we could find. Now with the online markets, you can get pretty much anything you want um, as long as you just go ahead and order it. So um, I did order these fenugreek leaves. So these are the dried fenugreek leaves. And I got these from, I think from Persian Basket. Um, this is the type of herbs my husband tends to bring when he comes back and forth from Iran or um, Oman or Dubai or wherever he's been. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about this mint when we're doing the salads, but this is how you can get the mint. And I will say that um, any of these um, dried herbs that you want to order online are probably going to, you're going to get a much bigger package for much less money than you would a small package at Wegmans or somewhere like that. So be, be careful and, and, you know, check out the prices. All right, so this is the dried cuckoo mix that um, I sometimes use if I don't want to run out and get the fresh herbs. Obviously, if you have fresh, it's going to taste much better and it's going to smell better. But if you, if you don't have that opportunity and you just want to do it and you have the dry on hand, you can always do that. 
Um, what you need to do though is rehydrate them. So earlier this afternoon, I uh, dumped out what I wanted and poured it into this bowl. And um, again, I, I kind of eyeball it and it's not an exact science. I would say I put about five cups of these dried herbs into this bowl because I'm gonna do five eggs. Um, and I'm also gonna throw some of our fresh herbs that we chopped up for the rice in here just to give it that added flavor. Um, so, but what you're gonna do once you rehydrate these by putting them in a bowl, and um, I used some water out of my samovar, but you can just um, heat some water in your coffee pot or whatever you want to, even a pan on the stove. So once you do that, um, you wanna make sure that the herbs are, have all got enough water in there that they're re everything is rehydrating. But as you will see, the water gets kind of brown and that's kind of the bitterness I think coming out of the herbs and that's why it's important to go ahead and rehydrate them. So I will do kind of what I did with the rice. I'm going to go over to my sink and just pour off that water. You can just, it's okay, I'm just pouring it off. So as you can see I'm just pouring that off. Well they can't see it. <laughs> And for those following at home, them, you're just using the fresh, right? What? For those following the recipe at home, they're just using the fresh, right? Oh, right, right. So if, yeah, if you're making this at home, you're just going to use those herbs in the quantities that I told you to get in the recipe. I'm just showing you how you can do it. Um, also, because when I went to Wegmans, they were very low on the herbs I needed. I, wait, I waited until yesterday to go. And I ran into uh, a, a fan there. So hi, Susan, if you're on now. Um, but, uh, so I'm using some of my dried ones and just a little bit of the fresh and using the majority of the fresh in the rice. So, um, now I've got my dried herbs. And as I said, I want to, Alex, can we go to the overhead? Yes. I want to go ahead and there we go. Add just, um, you know, a handful of my fresh herbs in here to give it that freshness. And now I'm going to grab my eggs. And I am going to beat my eggs just with a fork. right in there. Okay. Mix that up. Sorry, just getting to my make sure I got everything. Okay. Susan says hi. <laughs> hi, Susan. Okay. We're going to need the baking powder, Alex, and I'll do the salt and pepper. Let me get some baking powder out for me. Um, oh, here it goes. Okay. All right. So the salt and pepper, huh? Powder. Yeah, baking powder. Yep. Um, about a teaspoon of ground pepper. And again, I don't usually measure. I kind of eyeball it, but that's what's in the recipe. It might not be salt in the shaker. No, nope, I fixed them. And um, we're doing about one and a half teaspoons of salt. But again, if you're trying to go low salt, you can try to not use quite as much. Okay. And I'm going to put in here about one teaspoon of baking powder. That I do measure just because I want to make sure I don't overdo it. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to beat this really well to incorporate that baking powder. 
Um, Alex, would you get the cuckoo skillet on the front burner for us? Now at this point, um, some, some Persian cooks will also put um, other things in here like zareshk, which is known as rice. barberries here. Oh, our rice is boiling, Alex says. So we're gonna turn that down to very low and let it just simmer for a minute while we're finishing getting this ready. Um, so yeah, you could put, if you have them, you could put some Zareshk in here. Um, my family's not that big on Zareshk, so I don't typically do that. I typically just do it this way. Um, the recipe also called for leeks, which I could not find at Wegmans yesterday. So again, we have some of the green onion in here, which is fine, and we have the garlic. And you know, a leek is really just a garlicky green onion, so I think we're fine. It's not, it's not, um, it's not critical, you know, like I said, you can put what you've got. Okay, now we are going to take a couple of, we got two tablespoons of oil that we're going to Oh, that, sorry. No, this is what I thought. That didn't seem like enough. That was if we were going to have to cook the, the leeks. We're not doing that right now. If you have the leek and you want to do it, you need to um, chop and cook your leek in the oil ahead of time because it's not going to, your, your cuckoo's not um, going to be cooking a long enough time to get that leek really cooked well. So uh, if you're doing the leeks and the onion, the yellow onion, go ahead and um, do that as well. And then we need oil, Alex. So we're going to do about a quarter cup of oil in the bottom of our skillet. And you need a fairly deep skillet for this. Okay, so Alex is pouring some oil into our skillet. Um, we need to, Alex, how do you switch, buddy? Give you. There we go. I'll have him switch for us. All right, so Alex has poured our quarter cup of oil into our skillet. Come down there. All right, you wanna make sure it's all over the bottom of the skillet there and it gets hot. So while that oil is heating, I wanna show you that I went ahead and I pulled my rice off the burner because it was to the point where it has started looking a little bit fuzzy. And I know that's hard to see on camera, but if you're doing it yourself, you'll see what I mean. It, it just looks a little fuzzy. I don't know what other word to say. The, the rice has expanded and um, it just looks like it's grown a little bit. So I've gotten that to that point and we'll deal with that in just a minute. Oh, I didn't turn the oven on. <laughs> okay, sorry, all right. I'm gonna have a drink of my tea because it's cool enough for me to drink now. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, just a second. All right. So we're letting our oil get hot. Is anybody cooking along with me? No, no cooks today. I think there were a couple people who were. I know Susan was planning to. Someone said yes. Okay. And I think Tony was going to cook some, but she may be doing that later this evening. You definitely have a few people who are cooking. Looks like one, two, three, four, five, five or six people. Great. Okay. Well, if you need me to slow down because I skipped that leek and onion uh, portion, just let me know. Trying to keep up with it. Yeah, sorry. I know, I know the, the chopping of the herbs is a big thing and it does take quite a lot of time. Okay, so I'm waiting for my oil to get nice and hot. And I'm gonna stir this. I'm trying to get some air into your, into your herbs and eggs here. So kind oh. of whip it almost. Someone's asking about taking the rice off the heat. 
I did take the rice off the heat because it had gotten to the point where I want it to stop cooking and we're going to we're going to continue with it in just a minute and I'll explain all of that. All right. Once it gets that that fuzzy look and the water's about gone or you can just barely see the water underneath the surface of the rice, that's probably about where you need to stop and take it off the heat. So now I'm going to go ahead and put this into my hot oil. And I'm going to give this to my assistant here and I'm going to spread this around, turn my flame down a little, spread this around so it's nice and even. And you'll see that the egg starts cooking pretty quickly on the edges. So I want to go ahead and tamp it down nicely there so that it's even. Okay, All right. and now I'm gonna put my lid on and let this cook on about medium while we're doing other things. All right, now back to the rice. Alex, you wanna bring that over here? Okay, oh, some herbs in my strainer. Let me clean that out real quick. herb that's cleaned up. All right, now I'm going to take my rice and I'm going to pour it into the strainer I have in the bottom of my sink. I don't know if there's a way to there we go a little bit lower. Here we go. So I'm just going to dump the rice and get all that water out of the rice. And you can use some cold water to stop the cooking process at this point. You wanna cool your rice down. So I'm rinsing it with cool water. Also get a little more starch off. Okay, now I'm also gonna kind of rinse out my pan. All right, back over to the stove. This is where if you do not have a nonstick pan, you can probably um, do a different kind of what is called the tadik. And that is what is the crispy bottom of the Persian rice. And this is what Persian rice is well known for. Um, in our house, the kids and my husband fight over the tadik. They all want the tadik because it's this crunchy, buttery, crispy part of the rice. If you don't have a nonstick pan, what you could do is um, put some oil or butter in the bottom of your pan and either um, use a potato, a white potato, and slice it very thin, like maybe a quarter of an inch slices, and put it um, in the hot oil, like get the oil hot on the bottom of your pan, put those potato slices on there, let them cook on the one side until it gets a little bit browned, and then flip them over to cook on the other side. And once you've done that, you can go on with the process that we're going to do because the potato will be that barrier for your rice and it will create that, um, it, it'll help it not stick to, to your stainless steel pan. The other thing you could also do, which is a, an easier option that we sometimes do, um, is to use a small tortilla or whatever tortilla will fit in the bottom of your pan. Um, typically they would probably use a thin, um, a thin pita bread, you could do that. But here it works just as well and it's really easy to use a tortilla because we seem to always have those in the fridge. Um, so again, put some oil or butter in the bottom of your pan, put your tortilla in, let it cook until it starts browning a little bit on the bottom, flip it over, and then you can move on with what we're going to do now. So at this point, um, we're at the point where I'm going to go ahead and put some butter in the bottom of my pan. I'm going to use a couple tablespoons and let that melt. Any other questions while this is melting? Okay. 
And as I said, I'm a little bit nervous today because I know I have relatives in, in Iran um, and other countries tuning in. And I'm sure the ladies will say that's not how they do their rice. But as I said, for every Persian woman I've watched make rice, something about it was a little different. So as long as it all comes out delicious, it doesn't really matter. Um, so I was saying for the tortilla thing, after I have the tortilla cooked, I melt the butter on top of it or? Uh, okay, so what you're gonna do is put some butter in the bottom of your pan. Then you're gonna put your tortilla in. Melt that butter first, then put your tortilla in. And the tortilla is actually gonna, or the potatoes, whatever you choose, is gonna fry a little bit in that, in that oil or that fat, whatever you choose. Um, and once it starts to brown a bit, flip it over and you're seeing the already brown side now because the fresh side is down on the bottom. And that's when you're gonna do this portion. So once you've got that barrier in there, that cooked potato or tortilla. Okay, I've got my butter melted. I'm gonna turn my heat down slightly. And I'm gonna get my, I'll be right back. I'm gonna get my rice. So this rice has been straining in my sink, but it's still draining a little bit. So this can tend to be a little bit messy. All right, I'm gonna put about one third of my rice into my pan, into this butter. I'm gonna spread that out evenly on the bottom of my pan. Okay, now I'm gonna come back and get my herbs and I'm gonna take about a third or a half, whatever, of those and put them in there. I'm gonna spread that out evenly over the top of my rice. I think I need a little bit more. So it should be nice and, you know, just kind of cover that, that batch of rice. Okay, so I'm spreading those herbs out evenly over that rice. All right, now I'm gonna take another third or so of my rice, put it over the top of that. Kind of like making lasagna, right? Spread that rice out nice and evenly. Pull with some more herbs. Spread those out. Now we're gonna go with the rest of the rice. Pardon my fingers, it's easier. <laughs> Get all that rice down in there. So someone's asking, uh, please clarify, should I try for a nice layer of patty or should I use the potato tortilla layer at, on the bottom of my rice? So the, the, tor the potato, uh, the potato option or the tortilla option was for the people who said they didn't have a nonstick pan because I'm worried about, or I would be worried about um, the rice sticking if it's a, if it's a stainless steel pan. Um, so that was the option for that. I mean, we do make potato or tortilla rice um, in our nonstick pans too, just because sometimes I want to mix it up and I like the, the taste and the crispiness of that kind of rice. But um, for this particular one, because I want to show you what the, the rice cake looking tadik is, we're going with this really very traditional style. So you can do it either way. But if you do have that nonstick pan, this is a fun way to do it. All right, now I'm just gonna put a little bit more of those herbs on top. This is just for, to be pretty here. Okay. And as you can tell, I'm making a mess all over my stove, but that's all right. All right, just spread those out a little bit more. What is the temperature at for the rice? But we had it on um, medium to medium high when we were first getting the rice to boil.
But now that we are doing this portion of it, it will go down to, um, on my stove, my stove goes from low to nine. I usually cook it on four. So right, right in the middle sort of. Um, and as, again, I have a gas stove now. I used to have an electric stove and to be honest, I can't remember, but I think it was whatever was medium on my electric stove as well. Um, so now we're at the point where I know in the recipe there was a typo and I asked our multimedia team to uh, put the new recipe back on where I fixed the, the typo or the um, wrong word and I did I saw that it wasn't ever re replaced. It says six tablespoons of rice. It's six tablespoons of butter, not rice. <laughs> so this is where you're going to put um, a tablespoon at a time of butter on top of your herbs and rice here. Someone's asking, would you need to use a tortilla with a cast iron pan? Ooh, I have never used a cast iron pan. That's a really good question. I would say if it's well seasoned, you might be okay um, without it. Um, I know some cast iron pans really act like, like Teflon almost. So it depends on how seasoned that pan is. Okay, so I now have my, my uh, butter spread out. I had one out, buddy, where did it go? It was this thin one, the blue and white. Oh, there we go, it's under the box, okay. So this is the other part of uh, Persian cooking that's really interesting. The reason that this rice is not sticky, not, aside from the fact that the type of rice it is, you will see that they actually have um, these really cool things that fit over your lids, but I use just a clean kitchen towel. I put my lid in the middle of my kitchen towel, wrap it up around the top and wrap up all the sides because you don't want anything hanging down and kind of tuck it under the, the top of your pan if it's got a top. If it doesn't, I would use a rubber band or a clip to hold it all up like this and you put that on your rice. So that is gonna steam the rice, the steam is gonna come up and the towel is gonna collect that steam. And that's what's gonna give you that delicious, crunchy, hard bottom of your rice. So this is extremely important that you have that towel on the top here. So this is where I turn it down to about four on my stove. And we're gonna let that cook for about 30 minutes. Okay, and I'm having the same problem. It's not wanting to stay, so let me clip it here. I just use a chip clip or whatever I've got to clip it. And make sure that it is um, centered well on the bottom of your, your burner. And again, if you want to, this is where you could use your diffuser and put it under your pan if you want to diffuse that heat. It might also make it so that you have to cook it a little bit longer because the diffuser does diffuse the heat. So you might have to cook it a little longer. So for that reason, I'm gonna take it out because we wanna be able to see this when it's done. Ouch, that's hot. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move back over here and we will work through. Uh, is there anything about the cuckoo thing you know? Our salad. No, the cuckoo's cooking. Um, it's cooking and yeah, it's just kind of bubbling away here and cooking. I'm going to turn it down just a little bit because I can tell that it's starting to brown around the edges. So I'm going to let that continue to cook and I'm turning it down to about three on my stove. Two to three. Okay, next we're going to look at our fish. So what we're going to do, can we do the overhead, Alex? Mm -hmm. Okay. Move all these herbs out of the way. These herbs, anyone? Uh, not right now. You can put those aside. Yeah. Oh, well, let's bring the salmon over here, too. Okay, now I want to explain to you about the fish that I'm going to make because the traditional way to do the fish and the way that my husband did it when we were first married and I learned to do it was um, just to fry the fish. So you, we used to use a fish that was very popular called orange ruffy. Um, you can use tilapia. Um, my daughter's a little picky and doesn't like those. So what I got today was cod. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your fish and you're gonna dredge it in a flour that has two tablespoons of paprika, a tablespoon of garlic powder and some salt and pepper. So I'm gonna get my flour. 
my paprika and I've got my salt and pepper out. Um, so this is my paprika, which I also buy in bulk. I think my husband actually used to use a lot more paprika when he made these in the early years. Salt and pepper. Can you grab me the garlic powder, Alex? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna use this for the other one too, so it's fine. All right, now I'm gonna just mix that up. You wanna get the other skillet prepared. Um, yeah, I'll probably move that to the back. So mixing up our flour mixture here. Okay, I'll come fix it in a minute. Just um, get that oil heated up on, no honey, we need that one in the front. That's fine. Get the oil heated in that one. Put some oil in yeah, that skillet, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we've got our, our flour mixture mixed up. Now we're gonna take our fish, which I basically just um, rinsed. Now this is fillets, so that it's boneless fillet. And we're gonna dredge it in that flour. It's still slightly damp and that's why the flour is sticking. If you really want to, you could do the whole egg bath and flour mixture, but I, I typically don't do that with this because the fish is wet enough that it's gonna, um, some of that flour is gonna adhere. What do you want this fire on? Six? The, what the honey, the cuckoo? One. Yeah, the little That one fire. should be on like three. Three? Oh, okay. Yeah, and then the front one I need on high. Oh. Yep, because we wanna get that oil good and hot. And I'm just going to do a couple pieces here to show you because this is going to be saved for, <laughs> for our dinner later tonight. And we'll cook it fresh then. Okay, while we're waiting for that oil to heat up, Alex, let's sit these in the fridge. Mm -hmm. Get them. So there, there you go. Um, so while we're waiting for that oil to heat up and I'm dredging these, I wanted to talk to you and show you what we typically do now in our family. Um, because this whole fried version is delicious, but obviously fried fish is not nearly as healthy as baked fish. And because my kids are kind of picky, we have um, gone to making salmon for no roos most of the time. So the way I do this is I get um, a salmon filet uh, wherever you get your fish. Mine typically comes from Wegmans, but I know, um, you know, Main Bay here in town has delicious fish. Um, what I do is I go ahead and I salt and pepper my fish. I have just put this, I've rinsed this fish and put it on foil, dry foil. I do not oil the foil, I do not oil the foil because I want the skin to stick to the foil as it cooks so that I'm peel the fish off the um, skin as I get ready to serve it. And then I do some garlic powder. This is so simple and delicious and everybody raves about this fish and they have no idea how easy it is to make. And then what I do is I take your favorite Italian dressing. I tend to use this wishbone Italian Robusto because it's really strong flavored, but I just take that and squirt it over the top of my fish, give it a good coating of this dressing. And we bake that. And that typically I bake at about 350 and it usually takes 40 minutes or so. You can keep an eye on it. When the edges start browning and it looks good and done, that's when I think it's ready to come out. And as I said, when it's cooked, I typically take a spatula underneath and run the spatula between the skin, which is sticking to the foil now and the meat of the fish. And that way I've, I've kind of gotten rid of that skin part of it. So your guests don't have to when they're ready to eat it unless they want to eat the fish, I guess, or the skin. All right, we're going to put that in our fridge until tonight because we're going to cook that for our dinner later tonight. But now I also think our oil is probably about ready. So as soon as Alex comes back in, he had to take that to our outside fridge. As soon as he comes back in, he will move this camera for us. 
let me see. I think it's Spotlight. He's my technical director. Okay, you wanna, <laughs> there we go. Sorry. There we go, okay, now we're back on. All right, so we're gonna take, <laughs> take our fish that has been dredged in this flour mixture and shake off the excess flour and put it right in our hot skillet. Obviously, I would serve this with lemon wedges and probably some sprigs of dill if you have it. So it's asking what kind of oil are you using for the fish? Um, we typically use either just plain vegetable oil or olive oil. I know there's a lot of debate about smoke points and when, or when you should and shouldn't use olive oil. But because that's what I tend to cook with, we really usually just use the olive oil. Um, but it's whatever you have. It's not, it's not that important. I do use the extra virgin olive oil so you don't get a very heavy olive oil taste in what we're, we're cooking. But you can just use plain vegetable oil if you have it. So the fish is going to cook fairly quickly. And what we're going to do is just try to brown it on both sides. And while I'm doing that, Alex, you want to pull the stuff for the salads over under the main camera over there so we can get work on those. I know this one's running a little bit long today, folks. I'm sorry about that. There was a lot to get in. Okay, cuckoo's looking good there. It's browning on the edges, which is what we want it to do. Um, in the notes I got from those of you who registered today, I noticed that somebody did um, go ahead and find that um, whisk I was talking about last time. And they said they purchased it and they liked it. So I'm glad you guys found it and like it. I love it. I use it all the time. Fish is frying up here. it over and there we go and as you can see it's getting nicely brown of course it is fish so we want to make sure it's cooked all the way through I kind of wish it, got, it was a little bit warmer here in central Pennsylvania. Still pretty chilly here. Would that be nice if it were a little more spring-like? So um, in the email that I sent out to everybody this morning, I did go ahead and link the uh, video that we did at the station about no rooms because I was afraid and I was correct that we weren't going to have time to really get into that today and I wanted to share that portion of it with you about the tradition of Noru's itself and the special table that we set up every year in our home, the half skin table. So if you didn't take it, have a chance to look at that video, um, go have a look at it later when we're done and it'll explain a little bit more about what this holiday is all about. So that is getting almost done. Tamara, someone noted that one of the best investments she ever made for her kitchen was a good quick thermometer. It turned out to allow her not to overcook meats um, because she knew when it was done. She said fish should cook to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I know we should. I, I'm, I'm not a chef and I don't, I should uh, take, take, pay more attention to that. For me, when it 
looks done and it's flaky and opaque, I assume it's pretty much cooked, but you're correct. A thermometer is a much better way to go. Because, you know, it, it really depends on how thick your filet is, uh, how big it is, you know, how long it's going to take to cook it. I definitely use a thermometer when I'm doing something like a turkey, where you can't really tell because the skin cooks a lot faster and it's hard to know what's going on inside. With something like a filet of fish, it's pretty easy to see what the, what's going on. Yeah, we're getting very flaky and opaque, so I think we're about ready. All right, we're going to pull this off it on our plate for now. And I'm going to just move this out of the way and then I'm going to come back and show you the cuckoo. So let's turn this off. There we go. All right, now move the fish over here. So now our cuckoo, oh, look at that on the hot burner. There we go should be pretty well set. You can see that as I jiggle it, the middle is pretty solid. It's not moving around. So at this point, this is where I would go ahead and cut it into four pieces so that we can flip it. So just using a spatula, cut it into four pieces and now go underneath and flip it over. And do that to all four pieces. There we go. At this point, if you can see that there's still a little bit of oil left on the bottom of your pan, you're probably safe to just cook the bottom as it is. But if you want to, you can always just put a little bit more oil. We have the oil, Alex. Okay, just a little bit more oil in the pan to make sure that it's going to get nice and crusty on the bottom as well. Here we go. Now I can see that oil on the bottom. Make sure it's under all the pieces. Are there any restaurants with Persian food on the menu in State College area? <laughs> I've always wanted to open one, but um, no, not really. Um, some of the food that you will see at um, Turkish restaurants or Lebanese restaurants. Um, is similar, but it's it's not Persian food. Um, Persian food is pretty unique. Um, this is where I'm going to go ahead and cut each piece in half again, so that you have eight pieces. Someone's total. asking if you are using an oven-safe pan, can you put a put it in a broiler instead of cutting and flipping? Uh, I don't know. I've never done that. I'm not sure how well that would work. I guess you could give it a shot and see, but I've never done that. So now I'm going to put my lid back on and cook that a little bit longer. And then in a few minutes, when I feel like that's had enough time, I'll just take the lid off and let it finish up. My rice is still cooking um, on medium. So that's getting ready. Now we're going to come over here and make our salads. Okay, these are really, really easy to do. And we do these pretty frequently at my house. The first one I'm going to do is masto kiar, and that is basically a cucumber and yogurt salad. So I buy the English cucumbers because they're seedless. 
Uh, if you want to go to the expense, you can also, what would be even better is to buy the, what they literally are called Persian cucumbers. If you can find them in the store, they're the tiny little ones that are about six or seven inches long. And those are delicious and they're very flavorful and those are even better, but they're pretty pricey. So I usually go with just these English cucumbers. I also use whole milk, whole fat milk for the, or sorry, whole fat yogurt. Um, I used to use the 2% um, or the 5% or whatever I could find, but it's just not as creamy. And if you're gonna just have this occasionally as a special dinner, I think it's worth just going ahead and, and you know using the good stuff. So what I do is I try to go ahead and um, reincorporate any liquid that has pooled on top of my yogurt because that's good too and you wanna keep that. Um, someone asked about the cuckoo. Is it okay to put the cuckoo on a platter and slide it back into the flip it and then slide it back into the plan, or is it better to do the cutting into the floor? I guess you could try that. I've, I've never done that either. For me, it's just easier to go ahead and do it in the pan. But if you think it would be easier for you, give it a shot. I believe that's how you usually do a real Spanish omelet. Yeah, right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put my yogurt into my mixing bowl. This is one of my mom's favorite um, dishes too. She makes, um, we call this, <laughs> we call this yogi salad <laughs> at my house. Um, so she makes yogi salad at home for herself. Um, even when she's not having Persian food, she just really likes this dish. Okay, I'm gonna put this in the garbage. And now I'm gonna go ahead and get my knife and we're gonna cut up, we're gonna basically, cube this cucumber. So I cut it in half, lay the flat sides down, do about three or four lines down the cucumber and start chopping so that you're getting little cubes. Should be on four. Yeah. Okay. Same thing with this. The, I told them the cuckoo was on four. Yeah. Cuckoo on four. Yep. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and add the cucumber to our yogurt. I think our rice actually got put a little too high too, so I'm trying to help. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, some. okay, and now we're going to mix that up. also going to salt and pepper the salad and again you can do this to taste um, if you like things a little saltier that's fine if you're watching your salt that's fine too but remember that that yogurt is is plain yogurt is um, not very salty so you're actually salting not only the cucumber but the yogurt also and you can try it taste it see what you think and add some more I think it'd be a bigger spoon wooden spoon maybe Should put some in the dishwasher. I hope that one works. Yep. And now this is where I'm going to add in the mint. Um, some of my family members aren't a fan of the dried mint. So uh, sometimes I will take some out for them at this point, and then I will add in the dried mint for the rest of us who do like it. Um, I'm very lazy about my dried mint. So um, I, I often ask my husband to have one of my sister-in-laws um, do it for me and then he brings it with him. So when you get dried mint in the package, you'll often find um, the stems 
that are still left in it and it's tough and it's um, it doesn't rehydrate well. So it, it just, it kind of gives you some parts that you can't really chew when you're eating the salad. So um, my sister-in-laws will pick through it all for me. And that way I know I have just the beautiful uh, crushed perfect parts of the dried mint. And this is where I'm going to add again, as much as you want, I guess I'm putting about a tablespoon, tablespoon and a half into this and I'm mixing it around. Um, someone's asking what kind of mint do you know is like winter green spearmint? Oh, definitely not winter green. It's spearmint, uh, spearmint or, or peppermint. I'm not sure what, Hmm. I don't know. Any of the Persian ladies on know if it's pure, uh, peppermint or spearmint. It's, it's the dried mint that you find in your yard. I mean, once it goes into your yard, you can't get rid of it. It just spreads like crazy. That's the mint, but definitely not wintergreen. So mix that in and it is going to take a little time for that mint to rehydrate in the yogurt. So I typically like to do my salad a couple of hours before I plan to serve it at least, but you can make it um, a day in advance even and put it in the fridge. So this is masto kiar, and we typically serve this in ramekins or small bowls along with the food. So there we go. And I'll let Alex take that, rinse the spoon. Okay, next up is our other salad. Alex, can you turn the rice down to very low? I yeah, think I, I smell it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This salad has a few more ingredients, but it's very delicious. Do you want to mention that if the rice um, is good? Yeah. If your rice, um, if you're smelling it and it smells like it's getting a little, you can smell it hot. I don't know how to explain it. You can almost smell it. Then you might want to turn it down to low while you're finishing up your other things. So um, what I have is some baby tomatoes here, one onion, and another one of those, per oops, sorry, another one of those uh, English cucumbers. So what I'm gonna do here, I think I need a serrated knife. I'm going to cut my tomatoes. Everything has already been washed, but I'm gonna cut my tomatoes. And what you want is again, a piece that is easy to, um, to, to have a bite of, you know, if you get a couple of these in a bite, it's easy. If you're using like a beefsteak tomato, again, you want to just cube it and make them bite size. So that's what I'm doing here is putting these in there. And this is the slower part for those of you who are trying to keep up. I didn't pre-chop any of these, so this will take a little bit of time. The nice thing about Persian food is that a lot of it can be prepped in advance and then just cooked when you're ready for it. Uh, the nice thing about cooking in a Persian family is that typically um, all the, everybody tends to pitch in and help, which is nice. I usually have my sous chef Alex here and he can actually do all this himself. He's gotten very good at it. My husband actually um, was taught to cook by his mother when he was a young man. So when I met him, he already knew how to cook all the Persian things. And he taught me quite a lot. But as I've mentioned before, I also had a lot of um, friends over the years, um, Iranian ladies who I watched and who helped me learn. And I have some excellent Persian cookbooks. And I did recommend a couple of those last time. If anybody would like to know what those are, to send me an email back to that email that you got your registration links in, and I will send you links to those. One of them, unfortunately, is not even being published anymore, and I looked into it, um, and they're, they're going for quite a lot on eBay, but I love mine and would never give it up, um, but there are still some really good ones out there. Do you want to do all of those? Yeah, I just set that aside for tonight. Yeah. Um, 
what typically you also would be doing is um, you would have, like I said, some lemon wedges available to go with your fish. Um, Persians also typically eat all of these herbs that we've been chopping and cooking with raw. So you would typically see a platter of just parsley and cilantro and lots of green onions and radishes. They love radish leaves. They will eat the radish leaves if they're in good shape. Um, typically a block of feta cheese is also pretty common in a Persian restaurant to go with your bread. I really wish we had some good Persian restaurants around here. As far as I know, the closest Persian restaurant um, for us would be down near Philly. Uh, it's on Germantown Pike in Germantown, and I believe it's called Caspian. That's the closest one I know of. Now, if you're, if you're somebody who goes to DC frequently, there are tons of delicious Persian restaurants in DC. There are also lots and lots of Persian supermarkets in DC and the suburbs, Maryland. So now I'm cutting up this white onion, which will also go into small bite-sized pieces into this salad. And we are not as big on onion as my husband is. And since he's not here, we're just gonna go light on the onion. Typically I would use that whole onion in this if he were here. Um, and now the cucumber. So that is gonna be the same as the other one. We're gonna slice it down the middle, flip it over to the flat side, cut a few lines in there and chop it into cubes. And he says uh, that they really like the program. It feels like they're sitting at the kitchen table with some members of your family watching <laughs> you cook. That's how we want it to feel. Um, since we're running late and I'm doing this, I will tell you that next month, I'm really excited. My very good friend, Oljai Ayata, who is from Turkey, is going to be our guest chef in the World Kitchen. And she is going to do some recipes and tell us a little bit about the culture um, from Turkey. Uh, she's also going to um, talk a little bit about Ramadan because she is Muslim. And um, she's going to talk about what is coming up. I believe it's April 23rd. And uh, our next World Kitchen is on the 18th, I believe. It's that Sunday, whatever that is, 17th or 18th. Um, but the 23rd is Turkish National Sovereignty Day and Turkish National Children's Day. And so that's their big holiday that they celebrate. So I've got all my vegetables in here and now I am reaming lemon juice into my bowl. And this depends on how big your lemons are and how juicy your lemons are. I typically use two to three lemons when I do this. I think that the juice is really nice. Um, so I like to keep a lot of juice in. This is a really light and fresh salad that really kind of is very fitting for no ruse because it's all about spring and vegetables and healthy things. So get all that in there and let's see where we're at. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna actually salt and pepper this as well.
And I'm going to also for this one, and if you don't like the mint, you can leave it out or you can take some out for the family members who are not fond of mint. But this is where I also will put another tablespoon or so of the dried mint and mix it all in. And again, this is just like the other salad. It's gonna take a little time for that dried mint to rehydrate and flavor the salad. So you wanna make this a couple of hours in advance if you can, or the day before. I wouldn't make it much more than 24 hours ahead of time though, because the, uh, the lemon juice does tend to start sort of cooking the vegetables, I guess you would say. So you don't want them to get too soft. So no more than the night before if you're gonna serve it, but a couple of hours in advance if possible. Okay, so there we go. And that's just another really simple, but healthy and beautiful salad. All right, let me rinse my hands and we will go back to, I think I'll bring them over here, buddy, so we don't have to move. All right. You get a hot plate. Okay. So here we are with our cuckoo. And as you can see, it's nice and brown on top. And it should be nice and brown on the bottom as well. And that's the whole point of the cuckoo is that it be nice and crispy on both sides but soft in the middle. So it's kind of an herbed frittata is the best way I can think of to describe it if you've never had it. And at this point you could go ahead and decorate it with some um, barberries if you have them or you know um, maybe even some some dill on top or some other herbs just to decorate it with. So this is what this dish will look like when you serve it. There's the cuckoo. And now we will also do the rice. Are you going to flip it or shut it? All right. So here's my rice come off the stove. And we're hoping it's been on there long enough. All right, there we go. As you can see, I don't know if you can tell, but the herbs look cooked and that's the point. So the way that we do this is to invert it on a plate. Should we so we're, the other camera uh, hmm? oh. oh, okay, I guess you can. Yeah, yeah. just show them. The okay, way. so we've got the plate on top. We're gonna hold it and flip it. And there we go. And as you can okay. see, we have a nice crunchy. Oh, now we need to go back to the overhead. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, you were holding up sideways. So they Sorry, can see the, the you can layers. go back to the overhead there. You can see we have the layers of the herbs in our rice and our top is nice and crunchy. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> I wish you could hear it. It's, it's crunchy. So this is the part that everybody likes that they want to fight over because this is the crunchy, crispy rice. <laughs> and Alex just took a piece. So this is what we're looking for. I think somebody's saying something, Alex. No, people are just saying it. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so that is our rice. We have our cuckoo. We have our salads, which are already in the fridge. Or well, no, they're over here. Okay. So here we go with our salads and our fish. We would serve that with some lemon wedges and cut those in half again. And this is pretty typical for Noru's dinner. Um, there is another dish that is very typical, which is a soup called Ashereshte, which is a, a noodle soup that's delicious. Um, but I knew we wouldn't have time to do that today as well. So this is what it is. Um, if any of you are interested. Oh, someone said that I missed the part about the saffron. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. I didn't do the saffron. Let me do that real quick. Sorry. I got a little distracted because I knew we were running late. Um, so um, if, but what I was going to say is if you um, want to learn more about other Persian uh, meals or other Persian dishes, let me know. We can do this again at some point in the summer or the fall with some different Persian food. 
um, because there are so many things to do. Um, okay, so let's, Alex, I'll let you scoot that out of the way and I'll bring the background over. Scoot which ones? You want? All of them, just so I can get that under your forehead. Okay, um, back in October when we did the other World Kitchen, we talked about saffron and I mentioned that um, the saffron from Iran is hands down the best saffron there is. Um, you can get it here in, in the grocery store. Again, it's gonna be better if you can get it from a, a Persian market or a Middle Eastern market, it's gonna be much cheaper for you um, if you don't have a, a courier who brings it back and forth like I do. Um, but saffron, as you know, there are only a couple of uh, little threads of it in every crocus flower. It's the crocus, a certain crocus that makes saffron. And there are only a few threads in each one. So it's very labor intensive, which is why it's such an extremely expensive uh, spice. So uh, the way to make your saffron or to, to use your saffron, I'm sorry, um, is typically to use a little piece of the, uh, the, the, the sugar that I mentioned again. Um, so typically you use a little piece of that in a mortar and pestle and you crush it up a little bit. And then you take your few sprigs or however much you're gonna use of your saffron, put it in the bottom with that sugar and use the mortar and pestle to crush it. This gives it a, a very fine crush. And then you can put it in some hot water or hot butter, like a tablespoon of hot butter or um, uh, maybe a eighth of a cup of hot water and let it, um, let it become, let this powder dissolve. The other thing you can do, which is what I put in the, um, the recipe um, is one that actually is has gotten very, very popular recently, and I haven't actually done it, but apparently it works incredibly well, is to use an ice cube or a couple of ice cubes in a bowl and put your um, powdered saffron onto the ice cube. And there's some kind of reaction to that ice cube as the ice melts, it really makes the saffron bloom. So that's another way you can do it if you don't want to do the hot water or the hot butter. Um, and so what I would typically do if, if I was going to make this um, with rice is I would have um, done it in the hot butter or the hot water and just very um, quickly before I flipped the pan of rice, I would have um, poured it uh, evenly over the bottom of the rice before I flipped it. And that way the saffron would have gotten all through the rice. Alternatively, what you can do um, is you could take the tadic off and um, you could mix up your, uh, your rice and your herbs once you've removed the tadic and put some of that, maybe two cups of that in a bowl and use your, um, your saffron that has been either bloomed with the ice or um, done in the water or the butter and mix it into all of that to, to table, to, sorry, two cups of rice. And that rice will get very, very um, yellow and will become very aromatic from the saffron. And then you can sprinkle that over the rest of your rice so that everybody gets a little bit of that saffron rice in, in with theirs. Um, sorry, I forgot to do that, it was a little rushed. Um, we can try that again another time if we do it um, later in the year. Any other questions? Yeah, there were people saying that they do want to see more Persian food. Oh, great. Great. We can plan that. I know it's great to have um, other international chefs. This was always intended to be the world kitchen. Um, and now that we are hopefully coming out of this crisis we've all been in for the last year, we will be able to more and more have chefs from other places come into my world kitchen and cook for you here. Um, as I said, I was really excited when we got permission to have Oljai come um, because we're all vaccinated now and um, she's gonna be able to come in April. So that's gonna be really fun. Um, so yeah, um, tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest, the video from today will be up on wpsu.org slash world kitchen. Also the sign up for next month for Turkish will be up um, by Tuesday as well. So thank you all for coming. If you've cooked with
with me and you can take some photos of what you've done. I'd love to see those. We're trying to figure out where we can house those so everyone can see them. Um, and so please send me your photos. If you have any questions, if you'd like to know about those cookbooks I mentioned, just shoot me an email and I'll send you that information. So thank you all. Happy Nowruz.